Good morning, and welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds. It's really my pleasure to introduce one of our own. Uh, Jill Zabi is a uh, chief resident uh, who's going to be presenting her first Grand Rounds um, this morning. She is a uh, graduate of the University of Nebraska in Lincoln um, with a bachelor's degree in biological sciences. She then went on to the University of Nebraska to uh, continue and as a medical student where she graduated AOA. Uh, we were delighted when we brought her in with a class of excellent interns in 2012. She stayed on, completed residency, and is now near completion of her chief residency. Along the way, she's earned a number of honors. Among them, she was in the uh, 2014 Wisconsin ACP Doctor's Dilemma winning team. Um, she received the 2015 Resident Teaching Award, and uh, she currently holds the Vogelman Carnes Family Endowed Chief Residency. Um, she's been an avid volunteer, including the Wisconsin's Lions Camp uh, as part of the medical staff uh, making insulin dosage decisions for children with type 1 diabetes. She's been an educator with the uh, PDS course and a facilitator for the intern prep course. It's the course that's provided for fourth year medical students as they prepare for internship. Um, she's also been a, a uh, generous volunteer uh, throughout her career. She served on the selection committee for the College of Medicine in Nebraska. She uh, was a featured moderator for the New England Journal of Medicine uh, group open forum. She served on the patient blood management team and uh, serves on the medical practice group committee led by Mark Juckett for our department. Uh, having worked with Jill and knowing her from uh, having chatted with her before she, she made the wonderful decision to join us, she's a, a committed clinician and educator. And uh, after this year, she's going to go on and, and uh, back to Nebraska, where, sh where she'll be serving as, as a practicing hospitalist and uh, educator there. Um, the uh, not to not to put any pressure on you, Jill, but one of the one of the great pleasures for me, and and uh, really it should be no surprise that among our um, our finest uh, grand rounds are those given by our chief residents, and uh, and as such, it's really a pleasure for me to introduce Jill as she presents grand rounds entitled "Can You Deduce What You Transduce?" Integrated point of care ultrasound into medical education. Welcome, Jill. Good morning. So thank you, Dr. Page. I wanted to do my grand rounds about ultrasound because of an experience that I had as an impressionable intern. So it was January in the TLC, and I was the intern on call. We were admitting a septic, hypotensive patient, and like many on-call interns, I was tasked with putting the patient's arterial line in. And at that time, it was really common to use the palpation technique to do this. So I was sitting there trying to palpate this patient's thready radial pulse, kept trying, kept missing the artery, and finally, one of our fellows came in to rescue me. She asked me if I needed some help, and of course, as all interns do, I did need help. And she eventually brought the ultrasound in to try to help put this arterial line in. And so she showed me how to identify the radial artery on ultrasound. I put the needle in, hit bright red bl arterial blood immediately, and successfully put in the arterial line on my first attempt with ultrasound. So that got me thinking, why aren't we always using ultrasound for this? What else can we use ultrasound for in medicine? And in my quest to answer this question, it brought me back to an earlier technology that physicians use at the bedside to diagnose patients. And that is the stethoscope. So this is a painting of uh, French physician René Lenick, uh, who invented the stethoscope in 1819. And originally, the stethoscope was invented to help protect patients' modesty, but eventually it became clear that there were very important diagnostic implications for the stethoscope as well. 
and 200 years later, it still remains an integral part of our physical exam. But also a symbol of our profession. So medical schools like this one often have stethoscope ceremonies that go along with the white coat ceremony. Often students take an oath of the stethoscope. And today I want to talk about a similar tool that we can use at the bedside uh, to make management decisions for patients. And that is ultrasound. I'm not talking about this ultrasound, obviously. So ultrasound was first introduced in the 1940s. Uh, and this is a picture of an early ultrasound where a patient would sit in a bathtub filled with water next to a refrigerator-sized ultrasound machine getting grainy images of their body. Over the last several decades, ultrasound technology has progressed really rapidly. So you're probably more familiar with this ultrasound device, which looks like a laptop on wheels going around our ICUs and medical units. And in fact, now ultrasound can be fit in a white coat or a scrub pocket as well. So there have been few innovations that have changed the way that we interact with patients at the bedside over the past 200 years, but I think ultrasound is going to change this. So ultrasound technology has rapidly advanced. It's now portable, available for use at the bedside. It doesn't involve ionizing radiation, and it's non-invasive. And similar to the stethoscope, it allows you to see what, but it allows you to see what your ears can't hear. So this is the outline for my talk today. I'm going to start with some definitions of point of care ultrasound, then talk about how we use ultrasound for common internal medicine procedures, then talk about point of care diagnostic ultrasound, which is essentially ultrasound enhancing our physical exam. And then lastly, talk about how to teach this technology, how to implement an ultrasound curriculum. So this is an old definition from the late 1980s, but I think it still holds true today. And that is that point of care ultrasound is a diagnostic or procedural guidance ultrasound that's performed by a clinician during a patient encounter to help guide the evaluation and management of a patient. And I think the key thing with this definition is that it's, it's done by the same doctor that's taking care of the patient at the bedside. So it's not the same as a renal ultrasound that you would order, the patient would go to radiology and a radiologist would read it. It's done by the same doctor that's making all of the other management decisions for the patient. And I also want to bring up this concept that no specialty owns ultrasound. So these are the AMA guidelines on ultrasound credentialing. And the important thing to bring up is that ultrasound is within the scope of practice of appropriately trained physicians. So it's not owned by radiology or any other specialty. As long as you have had the appropriate training, you can use ultrasound. Okay, so with definitions out of the way, let's start with kind of where we're familiar, and that's using ultrasound for the uh, help to help you do internal medicine bedside procedures. And I want to start with central line placement because I think the use of ultrasound for central line placement is really common here and it's something that we're very familiar with. So I want to just briefly review the evidence for ultrasound guided central line placement. So this is an, a meta-analysis that was published in anesthesiology in 2013, looking at several studies that compared uh, the anatomic landmark technique for central line placement versus the use of point of care ultrasound. Their first outcome was looking at cannulation failure. So in this diagram, results to the left favor the use of ultrasound, whereas results to the right favor the use of anatomic landmark technique. And you can see that in almost all studies, the use of ultrasound improves the success rate of hitting the, the vein and successfully placing the line. And actually, the two outliers in this study are both done in pediatric patients. 
Similarly, for arterial puncture, so arterial puncture is one of the feared complications of central line placement hitting the artery instead of the vein. And you can see here, again, results to the left favor the use of ultrasound. And in almost all studies, ultrasound decreases the rate of arterial puncture. And again, the two outliers were those done in pediatric patients. And lastly, for internal jugular or subclavian central lines, the risk of pneumothorax is another one that is feared. And not all studies in this meta-analysis captured this outcome, but of those that did, um, it favored the use of ultrasound. So to summarize for central line placement, it, using ultrasound increases your success rate, decreases the risk of arterial puncture, and decreases the risk of pneumothorax. And this is our, one of our residents, Brian Drake, using real-time ultrasound to place a central line. And Lori Rice is the ponytail in the back who did not want to be photographed here. <laughs> uh, and so I asked our residents, what percent of the time do you use ultrasound to place central lines? And the dark blue in this pie graph is 100% of the time, and the 22% of the light blue are residents that have never placed a central line. So when our residents do place central lines, they're always using ultrasound. But remember, what got me excited about doing this, my Eureka moment happened with radial art line placement. So I wondered, what's the data for radial art lines? So I again asked our residents, what percent of the time do you use ultrasound to place arterial lines? And the results for this are a little bit different. And certainly when I started my residency four years ago, uh, it was really uncommon to use ultrasound for arterial lines. So it's really changed even over the last four or five years. So in this pie chart, the blue is 100% of the time, and the red is greater than 75% of the time. So you can see that about two-thirds of our residents are using ultrasound greater than 75% of the time, but there's still a lot of residents who aren't using it very commonly. So what is the data on uh, ultrasound for arterial line placement? So this is a study of emergency department patients um, that were randomized to either palpation versus ultrasound. Um, they enrolled 60 patients and randomized 30 to palpation and 30 to ultrasound. And then their outcomes were time to success. Is there? Do I have a little lead? Oh, yeah. There we go. Uh, time to success. And you can see that with palpation, it was 314 seconds versus 107 seconds for use of ultrasound. So it cut the time over in half. It also cut the mean number of attempts from 2.2 to 1.2 and decreased the sites used from 1.6 to 1.1, which if you're the patient getting the arterial line, that's a very favorable thing to decrease the number of attempts and numbers of sites used. There were a few differences in this study that I want to point out from how I see us use ultrasound here locally. And that is that they used, the way they used ultrasound in this study was that they aligned the ultrasound probe with the radial artery. So this is what that longitudinal view looks like on ultrasound. So here, the radial artery is a line, and you're able to see your needle uh, entering the artery, and you're able to see the whole needle and the needle tip. What I see our residents do here is the transverse approach, and in that approach, the radial artery is a circle, a pulsing circle, and you're able to see your needle aligned, but you don't have a sense of where the tip of your needle is. So I don't think that that negates the results of the study, but I just wanted to point out that um, they use a technique that is a little bit harder to learn, but you have a better sense of where the needle is. There's also a relatively recent meta-analysis on use of ultrasound for arterial line placement. And in this meta-analysis, results to the left favor the use of ultrasound. Their outcome is first attempt failure, or first attempt success, if you're thinking of it in the opposite, in the more optimistic way. Um, and you can see that, on average, the uh, studies favor the use of ultrasound. And actually, the two outliers here are both arterial blood gas collection, not actually arterial line placement. So I would argue they shouldn't have been included in the analysis. 
So what about other internal medicine procedures? Other common procedures that we perform in internal medicine are thoracentesis and paracentesis. I don't want to talk in depth about the data for this, but I do want to mention it briefly. So this is a meta-analysis looking at the risk of pneumothorax with thoracentesis. And I realize that the confidence intervals are wide, and that's a good thing because pneumothorax is, in general, an uncommon complication. But you can see that, in general, it favors the use of ultrasound to decrease pneumothorax. And I'll tell you that for paracentesis, the use of ultrasound decreases the bleeding complications. And this is, this is a study that's not about ultrasound, but it's about complications and how that affects a patient's hospitalization. So you can see that if a patient has a pneumothorax after a thoracentesis, their average hospital cost is about $3,000 more expensive. And if they have a bleeding complication after a para, it's almost $20,000 more expensive for that patient. And the length of stay is longer too. So I don't think it's too great of a cognitive leap to say that if we use ultrasound, we're also decreasing the cost of hospitalization and the length of hospital stay. So to summarize this section, procedural point of care ultrasound <coughs> makes procedures faster, increases the success rate of procedures, decreases complications, and is thus safer for patients, and requires minimal training, and we'll talk about what that training looks like a little bit later in the talk. So that brings me to the next part of my talk, which is point of care diagnostic ultrasound. And this is relatively new to internal medicine. And so this is one of our residents, Amber Hertztang, who graciously allowed me to use her photo. And similar to how our stethoscopes augment our physical exam, I want you to begin to consider ultrasound as an extension of the physical exam that allows you to improve diagnostic accuracy and make real-time management decisions. And I want to start with lung ultrasound because it's relatively easy to learn and interpret, and the data is pretty good. So this is the basics of lung ultrasound. And so to orient you, first of all, this is not a lung ultrasound. This is a CT image. Uh, so here's the patient's head. Here's the patient's feet. These are the lungs. Here's the patient's back. When you do lung ultrasound, you put the probe on the patient's anterior chest. And the first thing that you're going to see is the pleura. And there are two layers of pleura, the visceral and parietal pleura. And as the patient breathes, these two layers rub against each other in normal lung. And what that looks like on ultrasound is just one layer that you can see sort of moving. And what that really looks like on ultrasound is something called lung sliding. And so in this picture, this is the pleural line. And that sort of shimmering, glistening line is lung sliding. And if that's absent, that line looks a lot more static on ultrasound. So that's one concept of normal lung ultrasound. The next concept is A-lines, and it's a little bit difficult to see in this image. But again, the ultrasound probe is on the patient's anterior chest, and the top line is the pleural line. And A-lines are an artifact that are seen in normal aerated lung. So the A-lines here are these repeating echogenic horizontal lines. And what that is is an artifact of the pleural line sort of bouncing back and forth, reverberating between the patient and the probe. Next, I want to talk about B lines. B lines are seen in abnormal lung. And uh, the B, li B lines are these vertical lines that are seen in alveolar interstitial sy syndromes. And it's from some of the ultrasound waves making it through into the aerated lung. Um, so commonly seen in something like cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And then another thing you can see if the ultrasound probe is pace, placed in the lateral low back on a patient is something like alveolar consolidation. So to orient you here, the patient is lying on their back. Here's the head. Here are the feet. This is the diaphragm. Here's the liver. Here's the patient's spine. And remember, normal lung ultrasound had those A-lines. And here you're seeing sort of a tissue-like medium gray density. And so sometimes that's called hepatization of the lung. 
And you can see that most often in like a dense consolidation, sometimes in atelectasis. And these white lines are actually the equivalent of air bronchograms. And we can be relatively confident that this is consolidation because of these little bubbles that you're seeing here. And that's a dynamic air bronchogram. So you know that air is making it into that part of the lung, but uh, there's consolidation. And then the last thing with lung ultrasound that I'm going to talk about in this talk is pleural effusion. I think we're a little bit more familiar with that if you've used ultrasound at all for procedures. Again, this is diaphragm and liver, and fluid on ultrasound is anechoic or black. Um, so in this patient, you're seeing fluid here where there should be lung, and this is actually a tip of atelectatic lung sort of peeking into the image. So that's the basics of lung ultrasound, and I, I don't talk about that to expect you to be an expert in lung ultrasound at the end of this talk, but just to provide a framework for looking at some of the studies on this. So the guru for lung ultrasound is this guy named Dr. Lichtenstein, or Lichtenstein, um, and he developed a diagnostic uh, algorithm for using lung ultrasound to help uh, make a diagnosis in a patient with acute respiratory failure, and it's called the BLUE protocol. Um, and so I wanted to walk through a few uh, branches of this tree to just kind of give you a sense of how to use this. So we've talked about lung sliding. Remember, that's that shimmering pleural line. So if the lung sliding is absent, meaning that there's something in between the visceral and parietal pleura, uh, that can suggest pneumothorax. If the lung sliding is present, but you're seeing B lines instead of A lines, that could suggest pulmonary edema. If lung sliding is present and you're seeing the A profile, that could be normal lung, except the patient has acute respiratory failure. And so that could bring you down to the diagnosis of PE if you see a DVT on a lower extremity Doppler. Uh, pneumonia, if you're seeing that um, consolidation when looking at the base of the lung. Or COPD or asthma if you're not really seeing any of those findings. <laughs> and what Dr. Lichtenstein did was a, do an observational study of 260 ICU patients, and he applied this protocol and then compared it to the diet final diagnosis code. And so you can see that for these five diagnoses, pulmonary edema, COPD, asthma, PE, pneumothorax, and pneumonia, the sensitivity and specificity of lung ultrasound are really good, all greater than 80% 80, 80 and sometimes approaching 100%. And it's particularly good for cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Remember, I'm going to be a hospitalist, and I frequently have this diagnostic dilemma of seeing a patient in the ED who's short of breath, and they've got a history of heart failure, sort of risk factors for both pneumonia and heart failure. So I really wondered in non-ICU patients, how could we use lung ultrasound to confirm the diagnosis of community-acquired pneumonia? So this is a study done by a different group using a similar protocol, and it was a prospective study, or a randomized, sorry, a prospective study of 362 patients at 14 European centers. So what they did in this study is they enrolled patients who um, had suspicion for community-acquired pneumonia based on history and physical. So they either had a cough or a fever or auscultation consistent with pneumonia. And then they underwent a lung ultrasound by an experienced blinded practitioner. And of those patients, 214 had a lung ultrasound positive for pneumonia. Then the patients went on to have a chest x-ray or a chest CT, and of those patients, of those 214 patients who had a positive lung ultrasound, 211 of them had pneumonia confirmed on imaging, either x-ray or if the results were discordant, a chest CT. On the other side, of the patients that had a negative lung ultrasound, 15 of them had pneumonia confirmed, and 127 of them had pneumonia excluded, so a true negative. And this correlates to a sensitivity of 92% and a specificity of 96%. And there have been other similar studies done that have gotten similar numbers as well. 
So because I'm making this analogy to the stethoscope, I wanted to compare in this study how that compares to auscultation. So this is extrapolated from this study, patients that had auscultation typical of pneumonia. And in this study, auscultation of pneumonia was a sensitivity of 71% and a specificity of 77%. And remember that ultrasound was 92 and 96% respectively. So what are the limitations of this study? They had very experienced sonographers doing the lung ultrasound. They had a more extensive uh, lung ultrasound than a routine critical care exam. So a critical care exam is usually six to eight points on the chest, and in this study they looked at every rib space. The majority were in inpatients, which isn't a problem for me as a budding hospitalist, but it's not clear how we can extrapolate this to the outpatient arena. And then I just want to bring up that lung ultrasound in general is going to miss nodules or central lesions that we would normally pick up by chest x-ray or chest CT. And then in this study, the gold standard test wasn't perfect. The gold standard in this was chest x-ray plus CT. So if the results were discordant, the patients then underwent chest CT. And this, this is important because chest x-ray actually is not a perfect test for pneumonia, as you might know. So this is not about lung ultrasound at all, but I just wanted to bring it up because I think a lot of times we really hold chest x-ray results dear uh, when it comes to diagnosing pneumonia. So this is a study in ER patients who had a suspicion of pneumonia by chest x-ray and uh, physical exam and his history. So they sent all of their patients to the scanner, not, not uncommon for ER patients, and of the patients, uh, 33 of them who had an opacity seen on their chest x-ray had pneumonia excluded by a chest CT. But also, 33% of patients that didn't have an opacity on their chest x-ray had definite pneumonia based on their CT scan. And 56% of, of the patients, so over half of them, had their suspicion of pneumonia reclassified after having a chest CT done. So I just want to point that out to say that chest x-ray is not a perfect test for pneumonia either, but I think lung ultrasound can absolutely enhance our, our bedside diagnosis of pneumonia and certainly augment other imaging technologies. So I asked, so switching from lung ultrasound to some other types of point of care diagnostic ultrasound, I asked our residents, have you ever personally participated in point of care ultrasound? And here were the results. So I don't expect you to read all of these results, but I want to point out a common theme among our residents, and that is the IVC. So I didn't want to really talk about IVC ultrasound in this talk, but I felt like I needed to briefly mention it because so many of our residents are looking at the IVC if they're using ultrasound. So IVC is a correlate to CVP. So as the CVP rises, so does the diameter of the IVC, and then the curve starts to flatten as the IVC expands because the IVC physically can't expand farther. And I want to bring this up because we know that CVP can, in septic patients can be part of the picture for volume responsiveness, but it's not all of the picture, so we shouldn't be using CVP only to be making fluid management decisions. And then I also want to show this study, which is looking at respiratory variation of the IVC in septic patients to determine whether they're fluid responsive or not responsive. Meaning if you give, if they're hypotensive and you give them fluid, will it increase their blood pressure? And I want to point out before talking about this figure that this study by Faisal is the absolute cleanest study that we have looking at respiratory variation of the IVC in septic patients. And that's because these patients were intubated and paralyzed. So they were very laboratory, it was a very clean laboratory-like study. So in this figure, the first column here is patients who are uh, responsive, septic patients who are responsive to fluid. And this is a measure of the percent change in their IVC. So you can see in general that patients who are responsive to fluid have a greater percentage change in their IVC with inspiration and expiration. These are the non-responders, and they generally have a lower percentage change in their IVC 
But you can see also they drew this line at 12% to cut off the difference between responders and non-responders. You can see sort of wherever you would make this line, you're going to miss some of the responders and some of the non-responders. And this is the best study we have uh, looking at this, list, this topic. And I also want to point out these other two columns that are just looking at the actual measured diameter of the IVC. And you can see that um, there's really no correlation at all when you're looking at the absolute size of the IVC. So there are definitely trends, but wherever you make this, this cut point, you're going to miss people who would and would not respond to fluid. So I just want to put this out here to say use the IVC cautiously in patients who are septic. Think of it as a surrogate to the CVP, but not the, you shouldn't be using it in a vacuum to make management decisions. All right, with CVP out of the way, I was asked specifically to talk about ultrasound in the clinic setting. So this is the last study that I'll talk about in this section on diagnostic ultrasound. And I'm a hospital, I'm going to be a hospitalist, but I have obliged to talk about the clinic slightly during my grand rounds. So this is kind of an interesting study done at Brigham and Women's. And what they did in this study was enroll 40 internal medicine residents in all years. And they randomized 20 to the intervention. And what the intervention was, was they gave residents this handheld ultrasound and gave them a three-hour lecture on how to use it um, and some hands-on practice, and then allowed them to use it in their daily life for a month. And the outcome was an OSCE looking at um, a group of patients to identify some abnormal findings. And they were compared against a group of residents who could just use a five-minute physical exam. So here were the, the OSCE participants. So like every great OSCE, there were a few normals sprinkled in. And then these are the physical exam findings that the residents were supposed to pick up on. And I put these exam findings up here to have you note that there were 17 total abnormalities that the residents were supposed to get. And also to give you a sense that a lot of the abnormalities were cardiac abnormalities. So the primary outcome in this study was diagnostic accuracy. So you can see that the intervention group and physical exam group both did equally poorly in identifying these 17 abnormalities. So the intervention group who got to do the ultrasound exam and a five minute physical exam got on average 7.6 7 out, out of 17, whereas the exam group got 6.4. Important to note though is the false positive rate. I think one of the concerns with point of care ultrasound, particularly in untrained or minimally trained hands is that it's going to increase their false positive rate and send patients for sort of unnecessary ancillary testing, further imaging, further exposure to CT. Uh, and in this study, the results were very similar for false positive rate among the two groups. They also had a secret control group in this study, and that is the experienced internist exam. It wasn't these two experienced internists, but I'm using them as an example. And they did better than anybody. So they got, on average, 9 out of the 17 uh, abnormalities and had a lower false positive rate as well. So that brings me to inserting a famous quote about the physical exam. And I think all great Grand Rounds should have a Sir William Osler quote, but I just didn't find one that really spoke to me. And Osler lived in a time before ultrasound. But what I do think that study was missing was another control group, and that's the experienced ultrasound exam group. So I wonder what someone like Pierre Corey, who had, is an experienced ultrasound attending, how he would have done on that same OSCE. And this is Dr. Corey with his ultrasound bracelet that he's made himself walking around the ICU. So limitations of this study, obviously three hours is not enough training. Also, the abnorm abnormalities are primarily cardiac, and um, point of care echo has a bit of a tougher learning curve than just identifying ascites or identifying a pleural effusion. Also, I want to bring up this concept that ultrasound performs best at the extremes of physiology. 
And these were outpatients who could consent and show up for an OSCE on a Saturday. And so they didn't have the most extreme physiology. And abnormalities on ultrasound become more evident the more deranged one's physiology is. And then lastly, there was no Pierre Corey expert ultrasound group. So a fool with a stethoscope will still be a fool with ultrasound. And no one would agree to be in this picture, so I've sacrificed myself. But we need to know what we're doing with both tools. And the real question is how much training do we need? And that brings me to the last part of my talk, which is implementing an ultrasound curriculum. So this is sort of a brief history of the integration of point of care ultrasound. And you can see that cardiology and obstetrics were really ahead of the curve with echo and fetal ultrasound. And next is actually emergency medicine. With their FAST exam and um, use in the emergency department, they are actually pretty ahead of the curve with curriculum on point of care ultrasound. Then I would say, then critical care and anesthesia with procedural ultrasound, and internal medicine is probably somewhere in the middle with a lot of room to grow. I want to bring up this concept of diffusion of innovations, which is a concept of successive groups of consumers adopting a new technology. And the curve looks different depending on what the technology is. Um, and there's also a certain point at which adoption of the technology becomes inevitable that is different for each type of technology. So in this curve, you can think of the blue curve as incidence of learning ultrasound and the yellow curve as prevalence, to put it into medical terms. So I'll start with medical school and then talk about curriculum and residency. So what is the status of ultrasound in medical school? So generally, about 60% of medical schools can answer the question, yes, we have some type of ultrasound curriculum. But when you ask people who answer that question, yes, this is a survey of like deans of medical schools, uh, what that looks like is actually kind of important. So a lot of people say, yes, it's a tool for teaching science or medicine topics, which isn't really the same as, are you training students to obtain and interpret ultrasound scans? And when you look at actually hands-on experience in medical school, the rates are really low, especially in the first two years of medical school. So coming back to this diffusion of innovations curve, I want to talk about one medical school that was a little bit ahead of the curve, kind of in the innovators, early adapters part, and that's Wayne State School of Medicine. There are a few other medical schools who have an early curriculum, like Medical University of South Carolina and UC Irvine. So what did Wayne State's curriculum look like? So about 10 years ago, they introduced a curriculum to their first year medical students that included six 90-minute didactic sessions, um, some hands-on training, uh, and a competency assessment at the end of the course. And they actually based their curriculum on the NASA curriculum. So ultrasound is the only imaging modality in space and NASA had developed and published a curriculum that they were teaching to their astronauts to obtain images, non-physicians obtaining images in space. Here's their little ultrasound gel on the space station. So Wayne State used that curriculum uh, and adapted it for their medical students. Like a lot of curriculum research, it was a lot of outcomes research. So this is students rating on a Likert scale yeah, it enhanced my understanding of anatomy. I think I'll use it in the future. I'd benefit from more in education, and overall, my experience was positive. And so generally, they say four out of five to those questions. I'm not sure if satisfaction is the right measure, though. So they actually also had an assessment of students. I'll get to what this picture is in a second. So their assessment of students was embedding a grape in a piece of opaque gelatin to simulate a cyst. And then they asked the students to turn on the ultrasound, adjust the depth and gain, measure the cyst, and then hit it with a needle. So this is a ultrasound of a grape and a needle hitting the grape. And generally, so there were nine uh, parts that the students were supposed to get. And generally, they did quite well. Oh, almost half of them got all nine parts of it right. Um, and the average was about 7.8. So they did show that they could 
you know, teach the students how to do basic operation of ultrasound. So what can we learn from their program? It was generally well received by students. They had hands-on experience early in medical school, which is still relatively unusual. They had an objective competency assessment, that's the GRAPE, but it was separate from other curriculum, so it wasn't embedded into the physical diagnosis course or part of anatomy. It was a separate, actually optional curriculum. I just wanted to mention briefly what are we doing here locally, and right now we have an optional course in the M2 year that's integrated into PDS, and it's also integrated into the required radiology clerkship uh, during, res during medical students' third year. So that's sort of an example of a curriculum in medical school, but I'm a resident, so what's happening in residency? So here's the status of ultrasound training in internal medicine programs in 2012. So the top line is use of ultrasound for central lines, and you can see that almost 100% of medicine programs are doing this. And then the next few are Thora, Para, and Radial Art Lines. So you can see that there's some training for procedural ultrasound. There's a big drop off after procedural ultrasound for point of care diagnostic ultrasound, at least in 2012. The rest of these are diagnostic. So I wanna show two examples of what an ultrasound curriculum can look like during residency. And the first one is a procedure service done at UCSF. Um, so this was a trial published in 2012 looking at whether a hospitalist mentored procedure service can teach residents to be comfortable with procedural ultrasound. So this was their study design. They took their intern class, which is, this is not their intern class, this is our intern class, but aren't they cute? Their white coats are still crisp. And they randomized a third of their interns to the intervention group. And the intervention group was a two-week ultrasound procedural ultrasound course that included simulation, direct supervision by an ultrasound-trained faculty, and 10 didactic sessions, as well as some computer-based learning. So it was a pretty robust curriculum. The remainder of the class, these unfortunate souls, served as the control, and then they were actually surveyed for the the three remaining years of residency. So here were their initial results, and you can see at baseline, this is uh, confidence in using ultrasound. You can see at baseline, the intervention and control interns each felt equally unconfident with using ultrasound for procedures. Then, like, this is a little bit unusual for uh, curriculum research, so I'm glad that they did this. They actually waited another two years and surveyed them to see how long the confidence increase lasted after the course. So initially when they surveyed them, the intervention group, the ultrasound group, felt a lot more confident, but it was actually a durable change. So this is two years later, and they still have a statistically significant um, increase in confidence, particularly with thoracentesis and ultrasound for procedures in general. So to discuss this study, the use of a dedicated ultrasound procedure service caused an increase in confidence that lasted. They performed on average 16 procedures in two weeks, but it was a high cost. So to be cost neutral for a service like this, they estimated that they would have needed to do on average six procedures per day. Uh, they did over the year, 265 ultrasound guided procedures, but they had a pretty low complication rate, only four complications, all of which were bleeding after a paracentesis. So we, I wanted to advertise something similar that we're doing here at UW. I'm gonna play this animation twice because I'm so proud of it. <laughs> so we have a hospitalist procedure service that's coming in January of 2017, and it'll be a resident elective uh, that has trained faculty supervision and it's being championed by Scott Wilson. So that's an example of a procedure service. What does a more comprehensive ultrasound curriculum look like? And there's not a lot published on this because these curriculums are relatively new to residencies and we just don't have a lot of outcomes data yet. But there is one at Abbott Northwestern, which is a community program in Minneapolis. So I wanted to look at what their curriculum looks like as an example. 
So back in 2011, they trained all of their internal medicine faculty and their current residents in point of care ultrasound, and now have a curriculum that goes over the three years. And what their curriculum looks like, they have a one week boot camp for interns, um, a didactic series that runs, and during the boot camp, the residents are pulled off of service for, they do 40 weeks of learning how to operate an ultrasound, adjust the depth and gain, get basic ultrasound views. They have an ongoing didactic curriculum that lasts through the year. They have a regular ultrasound case conference. They have ultrasound simulation. And then they also have a lot of mentored bedside exams that the residents log. This is what their curriculum looks like. I don't expect you to look at everything on this slide. I just want you to get a sense that it's a really robust curriculum. They're looking at a lot of things. And they also have a relatively innovative way to, for the residents to track their ultrasound procedures. So they have a web-based or app-based system that they use to, uh, for the residents to log their procedures and log who supervised them. And that will allow them eventually to be credentialed for the, the exams that they've done enough. And they also upload all of their images to PACS. So obviously, because their curriculum is new, their outcomes research is still ongoing. Uh, but they have an ongoing, really large observational study that's enrolling 16,000 patients. And they're looking at kind of big picture outcomes. So things like, does ultrasound reduce cost? Does it reduce resource utilization? Does it increase patient satisfaction? Does it decrease radiation exposure? They have published a bit of their preliminary research, and this is looking at both faculty and residents' ability to estimate ejection fraction on a point of care or focused echo. And so the y-axis here is the formal echo ejection fraction, and the x-axis is the point of care estimation. And you can see that there's pretty good correlation. Each gray dot is an individual each dot in general is an individual uh, exam, and the white dots are if the formal echo said that it was a technically difficult exam. So that's an example of one ultrasound curriculum. What are the barriers to residency ultrasound training? Why aren't all programs doing this? And it really comes down to time and money. And so this is a, a survey of program directors um, again published in 2013. And the top barriers are cost and time of training faculty, cost of ultrasound equipment at the beginning, and then cost and time of training residents. But when you ask our residents, do you want more ultrasound training? Do you feel we need more ultrasound training in internal medicine residency? It's a 100% yes pie. So yes, residents do want this training. So that brings me to what is the ideal curriculum? And I'm shifting to my opinion here. And this is my drawing too, so just be gentle. <laughs> but I think that the ideal curriculum obviously starts in medical school. And it should start with knobology. So getting students comfortable with picking up and using an ultrasound and adjusting the settings to get the right image. I think this probably fits best into the physical diagnosis or anatomy course, so that you're learning it alongside learning the physical exam. You're learning to use the stethoscope while you're learning to use your, learning to use the ultrasound. And then students will get exposure to ultrasound appropriately during clinical rotations. So what does it look like in residency? Again, I'll take credit for this drawing. There should be definitely procedure simulation. The data for ultrasound-guided procedures is really good. There probably should be a dedicated procedure service because we find that residents, when they're on the wards, just don't have the time to step away for an hour to do that procedure and really feel focused on it. And so probably giving them a chance to really focus on getting more confident and improving their procedural skills is probably the best way to teach it so that residents can get the numbers to feel confident. We also need access to equipment, and that's not just the ultrasound machine itself, but also the ability to save images and have them reviewed by an expert faculty member to get feedback. It probably should be incorporated into our didactic series. 
And then we definitely, definitely need faculty mentorship. And faculty mentorship is one of the big barriers to this training because there's a lot of faculty members who don't feel comfortable with ultrasound really at all. And I think one of the ways around this, especially locally, is utilizing our TLC fellows who get a, a little bit more ultrasound training and can hopefully disseminate some of that to our residents. But this curriculum obviously requires teachers time and money, and those are the main barriers to implementing it today. So my final conclusions for this talk is that point of care ultrasound should definitely be used to enhance the safety and success rate of internal medicine procedures. I don't think there's a doubt about that. With proper training, point of care diagnostic ultrasound can improve diagnostic accuracy and guide management. It can augment your physical exam to help the patient at the bedside. Ultrasound training is well received by learners, but the barriers to implementing this curriculum include lack of trained faculty, cost, and resident time. And lastly, the impact of ultrasound training on patient outcomes is we just don't have enough information on this. It's an area for future research. So where are we with ultrasound? I want to end with this quote. That it will ever come into general use, notwithstanding its value, is extremely doubtful because its beneficial application requires much time and gives a good bit of trouble both to the patient and the practitioner. And that was Dr. John Forbes in 1821 talking about the stethoscope. So medicine must continue to innovate. And with that, I'd like to say thank you for listening. Thank you especially to the chief residents who've been very flexible while I prepare for this talk, and to Pierre Corey, who couldn't be here but mentored me for this talk, to all of our program leadership, and then particularly to Kate, Amber, Maddie, Ryan, and Clint for taking photos, and then to my husband and daughter who are pictured there. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jill. As anticipated, that was terrific. Um, looking in your crystal ball 10, 20 years from now, will, will the stethoscope be relegated to uh, Jedi Master as like a lightsaber, or is it still going to be uh, part of our medical equipment? So I didn't mean to negate the physical exam at all in this talk, so I'm not saying that there's not utility for the stethoscope, and you certainly can't replicate all the features of the stethoscope with the ultrasound. So I don't think the stethoscope is dead, I just think it needs a friend, the ultrasound. <laughs> I, I find that strangely reassuring. Let me have you call on the, uh, the audience and please repeat the questions for us. Dr. Barzi. did. Dr. Barzi's question is, how can we use ultrasound in patients' homes to, to keep them out of the hospital if possible? And the other question is, can we use ultrasound in developing countries to sort of enhance diagnostic accuracy? And I'll actually answer the second part of that question first. There are quite a few studies um, that look at providing ultrasound units and training to providers in developing nations um, because they don't have you know, CT scanners and MRI scanners in more rural areas. And yes, there's studies on that, and that is a good thing and does improve patient care in those areas. I didn't necessarily find anything in particular about using it in the home, but I guess you could see how with training, perhaps like, for example, using lung ultrasound to differentiate why someone is short of breath, and if it's worsening heart failure, giving trying to give them some PO Lasix if they really don't want to be in the hospital. I could see how that would be useful for sure. Dr. Beering. Uh, 
question was, Europe is a statement was, Europe is ahead of us on this, right? Yes, that's the answer to that. Uh, and then the second question to summarize it was, is this going to create turf wars? Do you think the reason that this curriculum isn't ahead in the US is because of um, concern about who owns these procedures? And I would say that maybe, although there's definitely, um, I mean, there's definitely times where interventional radiology doesn't want to come in and do these procedures. And I think that they have like plenty of procedures to do uh, already. So I don't want to comment on that too specifically, but I think that might be part of it. Um, and I particularly avoided talking about point of care echo in this talk to not offend any of the cardiologists in the room. <laughs> but I will say that point of care echo isn't designed to replace formal echo. It's a design to like make a quick assessment of cardiac function at the bedside to see if that would change your management of a patient. So if you have a patient who's hypotensive, putting the ultrasound probe on their chest to get a sense of whether their EF is about normal or significantly reduced would change your management. Yes. Thank Dr. Rocco for those insightful comments. We are going to have to close here. And, and in closing, I do want to thank uh, uh, Jill for just an outstanding grand rounds. <laughs>